Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 3. Uh, the subject we are going to preach about today has been mentioned in revival and last week as well. Uh, at least the person this subject is about to start with. But really it goes back to, i seen an article posted about compassion or conviction. Does a Christian have to choose between compassion or our convictions in how we address people, how we speak to people, especially about the things in the Bible and about Jesus. Uh, and there's a big misunderstanding, I think, in this world today of what compassion is. So before we really get into uh, the reading today, let me just say what, if I was to define compassion, compassion is having sympathy and sometimes empathy with a person that is, in stand, uh, that is standing in need of mercy and grace. Convictions is a code uh, or law or rules that we have that we live by, base our life upon, and we try to, to follow to the best of our ability. For us as children of God, that should be <coughs> biblical convictions on the top of the list. And well, you can have other convictions too. But all of our convictions really should have at its core, at, it, at its base, a biblical viewpoint. Now what this article was kind of stating... And kind of not. It was trying to ride the fence a little bit. But it was talking about a lot of the lifestyles and things in the world today. And how when Christians take a stand against it and we follow our biblical convictions, we're not showing compassion. And I've seen this a couple weeks ago, and it's been on my mind ever since. And Lord willing, we want to preach a message that God's put on our heart about compassion and conviction. I'm just going to tell you right now, a child of God needs to have both. Amen? And his compassion needs to be led by his convictions. I said our biblical convictions should be on the top of the list and our compassion then should follow and what God is compassionate about we should be compassionate about. We should always be able, able to stand for biblical truth regardless of where we're at, situation we're at, or who we're talking to. Amen? Because God's word is true. All the Time. Amen. Amen. So, the gospel according to Luke, chapter number 3. Start in verse 1, read about 20 verses or so. It says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria, and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanitis, the tetrarch of Abilene. Now that's not Texas, by the way. <laughs> Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the word of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. 
Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also is the act the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, to him let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in this exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodotus, uh, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Oh, maybe for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. And all you do for us, for your grace and your mercy. Lord God, for your compassion, we thank you, but also for putting your convictions in us and how we should live and how we should act and how we should speak. Lord God, may we always rely and trust in that truth that you put in us, no matter what we're feeling at the time, that your truth overrule in all situations. God, I pray that you forgive me where I failed you. Lord, and just falling short of your will. And God, I ask you, Lord, just here today to preach through me your truth. May your truth become our convictions. And Lord God, I pray today that if there's one here that is lost, that does not know you. Father, I pray that they might feel your truth in them which would bring about the other type of conviction that they might turn from their sins and be saved before it's everlasting too late Lord help us always just to preach what thus saith the Lord Lord not something to please the people but what would please you Lord God, we just ask you today to go with us now. Lead God and direct in everything said and everything done. Lord, I just pray you save the lost and revive the church, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We look at this passage of Scripture, and John was an amazing figure in the Bible that seemingly come from nowhere and burst onto the scene, was rough around the edges, uh, rough in the way he looked, straightforward as he talked, but had a desire and a burning passion for God and for the truth. And God had given him a special job, if you will, to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ in this world to begin his public ministry, to start preaching to people the things that Jesus would preach and would confirm what John had said, to start turning the hearts of people back from their own ways to God's way. And in order to turn people from their own ways to God's ways, you have to preach God's truth. Amen? 
And God's truth does not always please us. But that's not what God's truth is set to do. God's truth is set to change us, to remake us, uh, to conform us, if you will, to His will. To make us into what God wants us to be. John did not tiptoe around the tulips, as was mentioned in the revival by Brother Dwight. He didn't try to sugarcoat things, and he didn't try to uh, ease the word in there. He spoke the truth with conviction. Did he have compassion when he done it? I believe he did. Compassion is looked on, as I said, different in this world. We have compassion on people when we speak the truth to them. If we didn't care, we wouldn't say anything. Just let them die and go to hell. Right? But compassion, the compassion that God placed inside of me, compels me to tell a lost sinner that they're bound for hell unless they get saved by the grace of God. Amen? That's compassion. I'm not going to say sometimes it may come across as uncompassionate. And we have to watch that and we have to uh, really go with what God is telling us to do because we can come across as not having compassion. Uh, you see some on TV that there is no compassion at all in their message. And that's the ones that uh, the media wants to say, well, this is how fanatic Christians are. And I'm just going to tell you, what they say is a lot of the truth, but it's done and not seasoned with love. It's done for the wrong reasons, to prove them right and to prove them, the others wrong. When we preach our convictions, it's not just to prove the others wrong. It's so that they will know the truth and then the truth can do its work and set them free and deliver them from hell. And if you're given the truth for any other reason, you need to go back and check the compassion part. Now, with all that being said, uh, you know, I posted something on Facebook a little bit ago, and it was so true when I read it that sometimes the truth seems like hate to those that hate the truth. You got that? The truth seems like hate to those who hate the truth. That is what Jesus said, is it not, in John. When He said men chose darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil and the light was exposing their darkness. And that's why they hated the light. Because they didn't want to have their deeds exposed. This world looks at our message so many times as hate speech. And I'm just going to tell you, brothers and sisters, there's coming a time in this country and I believe in the near future that what we preach will be deemed as hate speech. And that is what will get us thrown in prison. Unlike, oh John, or just like I should say, not unlike, John, who preached the truth. And yes, he preached it in compassion. Say, well brother, he called them all vipers. He told people the truth sometimes. And I'll just say this. Let me just turn. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But I, I want to turn over to the first chapter of the book of Jude. When you get there, you realize it ain't but one chapter. In verse number 22 and 23, it says, And some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We've preached on that verse many times. Some having compassion. It don't mean there's not compassion in both of them. But there is some that it takes the more, and I don't know how to really put this, but the more uh, subdued loving approach and, and building a stronger relationship and, and easing the word in there. I understand that. And some, it takes shock and awe. 
Because they have lived their whole life this way. And it takes somebody kind of shaking the truth in front of them saying, Listen, this is destroying you. And that's what John did here. He preached the truth on each one of them's level. Is that not what Jesus did? You know what Jesus did? Same thing John did. Old generation of vipers. He called them where they were. If you'll look at all the examples here when uh, John was telling them to bring forth the fruits Worthy of repentance. Now, I want you to understand, uh, and, and people can get confused on this a little bit, because if you go back to verse 7, uh, or verse 3, I'm sorry, he and he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. A lot of people look at that and say, oh, see, baptism is how you have your sins forgiven. No, there's a little word in there that causes a lot of people a lot of grief. The word for. There's another verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, has that same little word in there, for. You know what that word is? In the Greek, it is eis. E-I-S. It's pronounced eis. And it means because of. Because of. We are baptized not in order to obtain but because we have been saved. And John's telling them here, uh, when you come on over to where he says, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, let your actions back up what's happened inside of you. Is that not what Christians are supposed to do? We are to bear the fruit of salvation. And as you come on down through here, that's why they ask, you know, what shall we do? In verse 10, it says, And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered each one of them to the particular thing that was besetting them, to the particular sin that was easily besetting them. Whether he talked to the publicans <coughs> about not exacting more, then you should. That was what they did. They cheated people on their taxes. Imagine that. The soldiers. He commanded them not to do anything, any harm to anybody. To do violence to no man. Or accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. That was a problem. Not in their just regular line of duty, but they were doing harm where it was not called for. They were being bullies a lot of times. He hit each one of them, if you will, where the problem was. And therein lies the problem of when we speak the truth to somebody and address something that is going on in their life, we don't like to be called out on our sins. Amen? Everybody, it's okay to say amen to that because I don't like it either. I don't like somebody to point out my flaws. We have to realize, though, and it's not always, but we have to realize when somebody is pointing out a destructive sin in our life, and for a Christian, this is the way we always ought to do it, it's in order for that person to see how destructive it is and to turn back to God and ask God to forgive them and ask God to uh, lead them and show them the way. And that way, that destructive uh, behavior, that sin in their life, wouldn't destroy them completely. I'm just going to be honest. I, I've, I've been uh, up to people and, and told them, listen, this is going to destroy you. It's hurting you. And I've had some listening. And I've had some... Eh. Be all right. And you know what happened? It destroyed them. Destroyed them. Destroyed their family. Destroyed their reputation. Destroyed them financially. Made a mess of their life. God has given each one of us the ministry of reconciliation. 
to bring people to reconcile themselves with God. And in order for us to be able to perform the ministry of reconciliation, you know what we have to do? We have to address sin. I can't get up here and fully fulfill what God's called me to do by just saying, and Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves you. Because people can go, eh, no matter. But when you fully realize how much of a sinner that you are, how far uh, uh, that you have sinned against God, and He loves you anyhow and died for you, that has a whole lot more meaning, doesn't it, brother? We have to know why and the uh, gravity, if you will, of God's love towards us. Or what we say is just meaningless. People have to know they are sinners before they can be saved. Amen? Amen. And people have to realize they're sinners before they can really understand how much God really does love them and how much compassion He really has on them. Because God being a holy God, the moment we sin, He can say, you're done. He would be all absolutely holy and right and just to do that to us. But aren't you glad He does you wouldn't have anybody to preach to you today in here, and you wouldn't be here either if that's the way it worked. But we realize when we are sinners, there's how much God really loves us and has compassion on us. And we have to show that compassion to others by telling them the truth. I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you, and, and, and a, a verse I like, and y'all can go ahead and be turning there. I'm going to be turning Proverbs chapter 27. preached on this a, a good while ago. But it's so true. Do you have friends that you can count on to tell you the truth no matter what? Whether it hurts your feelings or not? It's good to have friends like that, isn't it? That will tell us the truth whether we want to hear it or not. If it's something that's hurting them, something that's destroying them, it's a blessing to have that kind of friend. You might not think of it that way at the time. But verse, in, in Proverbs 27, verse number 5 and 6, it says, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Let me just stop on that one right now. If we as children of God say we, we love everybody and we want everybody to go to heaven, but yet we are secret about that fact and we're unwilling to go out to them and say, listen, we're sinners bound for hell, but this is what Jesus did. This is how much Jesus loves you. This is what your sin and where your sin is going to get you, but God's love can forgive you and save you. If we keep that to ourselves, how much love do we actually have for them? It's secret love. That don't amount to much, does it? Open rebuke is better than secret love. And verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. Your friend tells you something, that is hurting you to try to deliver you from that because they love you. And it may wound you at the time, it may hurt you at the time that that's brought to light in your life. But it's for your betterment. It's for your good. It's for your life. But what would the enemy do? They'd come up and pat you on the back. Ah, oh, you know, I know you're feeling down right now because you're involved in all this, but you just keep going. It's all going to be all right. Just keep doing what you're doing, and it'll work out in the end. And they'll pat you on the back and kiss you all the way till it destroys you. That's what an enemy does. 
I want to tell you something. We see this played out in the, in the, the world political scene all the time. Uh, one country that don't like us, and then, oh, they want to go to bragging on, on the United States or whatever and patting them on the back, and it doesn't, all you got to do is read history books to see how this works. And they keep bragging, and they keep patting, and they keep patting, and they keep kissing, and all that stuff, until they come in and destroy us, or let us destroy ourselves from within. just wants to look good to us so we'll keep doing the same thing over and over. You know that's what Satan does to us? He keeps presenting it the very best he can. He keeps making sin look the very best that it can. And he keeps singing us that lullaby that it'll all be alright. Don't worry. Don't fret. Everything's going to be fine. Now, do you rather have a friend that tells you the truth to jerk you out of the sin and the destruction you're in, or would you rather have somebody let you go off the cliff? I thought about it this way, and I'm pretty sure I've used this example before. If you come down towards my house, and you see my house blazing on fire, it's in the middle of the night, though, so I'm asleep. And you have compassion on me. Well, Brother Jason really needs his eight hours of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, would, I would warn him about the danger, but I really don't want to wake that precious soul up. <laughs> Is that compassion? <laughs> in your, your compassion... I'm going to burn up. I'm going to be dead. But you see, as comical as that sounds, that's what the world looks at as compassion, to just let people burn in their sins and just tell them it'll be all right. Instead of warning them. If you had compassion on me, what you would do, you would knock on the door. If it didn't come to the door, you'd break the door down. You'd bust the windows out. You'd do whatever you could to say, get up now and get out of this house. And if I said, no, I just want to sleep a little bit longer, I'll get up in a little while. Would compassion say, all right, I'll be back in a couple hours? <laughs> Or would it go in there and jerk me up out of the bed and say, you got to go now, whether you want to or not? That doesn't seem like compassion, does it, to manhandle somebody and say, come on, you're going now, and be screaming in their face. Does it seem like compassion? No. But is it compassion? <coughs> you better believe it. See, the world's view on and perspective on compassion is skewed. They want us as people of faith that has biblical convictions not to preach hard to them. Just to tell them how much God loves them anyhow. In their sin. And then that's it. We have to look at what Jesus did though. Did Jesus love people in their sin? Yes. Did he want people to stay in their sins? No. I use this example a lot because it's just, it reminds me of us, of every human being so much. I think about the woman that was caught in adultery, which had to be a little set up there to start with. We won't get into all that today. But all these religious leaders brought them to where Jesus was as he was kneeled down, drawing in the dust. And they threw this woman down and said, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Said Jesus never even looked up. And he said, all right, whoever's without sin, first cast the stone at her. You know what? By the law, she was worthy of death. By stoning. There was more than two witnesses. She didn't even deny it. So she was worthy of death then and there. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, 
that they started dropping their stones one by one and left. And that's when Jesus got up and addressed this woman. He said, woman, where's your accusers at? She said, I have none. He said, I don't condemn you either. But then what did he say? Go and sin no more. He didn't try to say, sweetie, honey, it'll be all right. You just go back to living like you was. Forget what they just did to you. You just go back to your life. See, he didn't do that. She knew the sin. He knew the sin. But what he did was offer her forgiveness and then uh, the power to change the way she'd been living and said, go and sin no more. does not want us to address sin that way. All it wants us to do is to pat them on the back and say, you're alright. Don't worry about it. Just go back living like you were. Forget what anybody else says because God loves you regardless. Partial truth. Partial truth. And the world is getting the partial truth over and over and over again from people that are called religious leaders. Isn't that what Satan did in the garden? When he tricked Adam and Eve? Did God surely say, and he gave them a half truth, did he surely say you would die? You're not going to you see, when they took a bite, they were still alive, right? Physically, they were still alive. You see, Satan didn't tell the full truth, though, that they died spiritually at that moment. Satan, and I'm just going to say, those that's controlled by him in this world, they will always feed you a half-truth. But when they do that, they leave out some of the most important information. And that's the part that will condemn you to a devil's hell. So let me tell you, Satan don't want to be alone down there. Even though he will be, even though it's going to be full, the Bible even says that hell, right now at this moment, is enlarging itself. Making room for a lot more. But he wants all of God's creation to be there because he hates God that much. So don't think Satan is going to tell you the truth, the full truth. We go on down through here. John preached, back over Luke, John preached the truth. And he preached it boldly. There is a time, I'll just say it this way, the time is now that we as Christians need to be bold. Amen. We need to preach the truth in love and in compassion while we're doing it. Not elevating ourselves above anybody else, but letting people know that we're sinners, yes, and God loves us the same way He loves you and can deliver you from that sin. Not for you just to go back and live like you were, though. We need to proclaim it boldly, especially now, even as it's trying to, uh, uh, the world's trying to put a gag order on us, if you will, trying to make us not able to speak, not able to proclaim the full gospel like it should be, like it needs to be, like it has to be for men and women, boys and girls to go to heaven, to have their sins forgiven. John preached boldly. I want to turn to Ephesians. I'll just read a couple of verses over here. Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 19 says, And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador 
in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. There's a whole lot of times in the Bible that the word boldly is used about speaking boldly. Paul used it a whole lot to speak. Uh, would say something about speaking boldly. He always had a desire that God would give him the strength and the unction to speak boldly. Not what people wanted to hear, but what they needed to hear. The truth. He said that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. What's the gospel? That is the good news that God loves us. Even in our sins, He loved us, came to this world to go to the cross to pay our sin debt so that we could be forgiven and be delivered from our sin and then live a holy life according to His Word. That's the gospel. We sometimes cut it short. That's the whole gospel. He said, I want to open my mouth boldly. And then it really goes, verse 20, you can't leave verse 20 off when he talks about being an ambassador in bonds that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. As I ought to speak. You know what an ambassador is? When the United States sends an ambassador to another uh, foreign country, they are going there representing the United States and the interests of the United States. And this ambassador ought to speak what he's been told to speak for the interests of the United States. Now, is he much of an ambassador if he goes over there and there's a certain situation or problem uh, that the uh, leadership of the United States wants to have discussed and wants to have uh, remedied? And he goes over there and they sit down at the table and they say, what's on your mind? I just come to see how y'all was doing. Just want to come shake hands with you, that's all. And never address the issue at hand? Would he be an ambassador? No. Because he's not representing what he was sent there to do. We are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God's directing us to speak to someone about him, we just come up to him and say, Oh, I just, I just want to say I love you. And I just want to shake your hand, pat you on the back. We'll see you now. Have we been the ambassador of Jesus Christ? He gave us a word that we ought to speak to them. The gospel. And if we don't fulfill that, we cannot call ourselves ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I want to be that ambassador that I speak boldly what I ought to speak. That ought to be on everyone's heart and everyone's prayer ought to be that right there. And we need to pray that God gives us a clear message. So I'll be times, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest and just made an example of it. There's times that I preached and I know it wasn't clear. I couldn't get the words around it that needed to be. Because I was trusting more of what I was going to say instead of what God wanted me to say. I'm going to tell you, if you trust what God wants you to say, it will be clear and presented right every time. Amen? I thought about it this way. If our message is not clear, will people fully understand what God, who God is and what God wants them to do? Who they are and what they need? The danger that they're in. It's like the, the people going down the road. And somebody waves them down. And they stop and say, you can't go this way. You're going the wrong way. The people in the vehicle say, I've gone that way all my life. We'll see you. And they take off down the road. And somebody else then waves them down and says, it's not good for you to be going this way. You need to 
to turn around. So I, I, I went this way yesterday. I'll be all right. And they go down the road until it's too late. The bridge is out, and they go over the cliff. Now, what should sort of the messages have been from those two that stopped these people on the road? It shouldn't have just been, oh, you're going the wrong way, you need to turn around. Oh, it's not, not good for you to go down this way. It shouldn't have just been that. It should have been, the bridge is out. If you go further, you'll go off and you'll die a horrible death. That gets your attention a little bit more, doesn't it? We, as the children of God, have to present that message just as clear. That... Well, Christianity is a good way, and you need to get on that way. Is that going to compel anybody to do that? <clears throat> no, because what does everybody think before uh, they get saved? They're going all right as it is. I did. I thought, well, I ain't done nothing too bad wrong. I'm going just fine down this road. It was not until I was presented with sin what sin was and how I had committed sin and how I transgressed against the holy God that I realized that I was in jeopardy and people told me that if you die in that state without making peace with God, without uh, being saved, without being forgiven and born again, that you would die and go to hell. It was not until then I realized this is serious. And I've got a choice to make now. I can either ignore the danger that they told me was coming and just keep going and see what happens or I can investigate see if what they spoke was true and go the right way. We need to be telling people not just to turn around and go a different way because it's a better way or a good way which it is, that's truth. But it's not all the truth. We've got to tell them why. And the why is what makes people think sometimes we don't have compassion. When we tell them it's sin to steal. It's sin to commit adultery. It's sin to murder innocence. All the way down the babies in the womb. When we tell them it's sin to Lust. And to desire to gain what other people have. That's when so many times the people think that's hate speech. And they don't see why we told them and warned them. I'm not going to lie. People's not always going to appreciate you telling them that message. Amen. They're not going to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you told me that. I had no idea. But sometimes they will. More often than not, you'll get backlash with it. You'll get the look. You'll get the stare. You'll get the hatred back. Because they think you said it out of hatred to them. Sometimes might end up like John the Baptist in prison. And I tell you this because it's coming. and coming quickly. And it just didn't end with prison for John the Baptist either. He had told Herod that he couldn't sleep with his sister's, or his, his brother's wife. And he didn't like him. But she really didn't like him. And she wanted John the Baptist dead. And in fact, had him beheaded and his head delivered to her on a charger. Chargers like a plate, like waiters would carry out and lift up the thing, show you your food. That's where his head was. And you might have sometimes people are like Herod. He preached the message to Herod. Told him where he was in sin. And what intrigues me about it is because he had the power to execute John right then if he just wanted to. But he didn't. 
he did have him put in prison, but he had enough concern that he wouldn't do anything else to him until he backed himself in a corner and had to because of Herod's brother's wife. As I said, sometimes you'll get those people that hear the message and they'll see the compassion. They'll understand why you told them what you did. And they'll see the error of their ways. They'll see their sin. And God will bring that conviction on them that brings about salvation, that brings about conversion. But we don't need to be cowards. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the power to accomplish His will. And God don't want cowards. He wants people that will boldly proclaim what thus saith the Lord. I had a lot of other places I could have gone today. To be honest, I thought about Paul a lot. I thought about Jeremiah a lot. I thought about Noah a lot. All those people boldly proclaimed the truth of God. By some they was considered to be hateful. But then there was others that heard the message and got converted and were saved. And I'll say this today. All of us in here are no different. We all had that choice at one time. When the message was presented to us, Brother Donald preached to me before I got saved over and over again. And he presented the gospel to me. And there came a time that God showed me that what he was preaching was the truth. Showed me that I was a sinner bound for hell if I didn't get saved. And at that moment gave me a choice. To either come to Him and ask forgiveness and to be saved or to go my own way and be condemned to a devil's hell. You see, it's for us to just proclaim the truth. And God will work it in each one's life how it needs to be worked. And some people won't make the choice correctly and some people will. I say all that to say right now, guess what? You have a choice in here today. Sometimes we get kind of scared using that word choice. But God don't make us robots. When we get presented with the gospel, with the truth, and He convicts our hearts, He doesn't force us to become Christians. He gives us the choice then to come to Him or to reject Him. Lost friend, I preached it over and over. And I hope you know that I preach to you the truth and I preach hard, if you will. I preach hell because it's just the truth. And I don't want anybody to go to hell. And if you've been delivered from it, you better not want anybody to go there either. Which if you're saved, you've been delivered from it. I hope you understand why we preach the way we do. Because God calls us to it. We are the called. And we are to proclaim boldly what thus saith the Lord. And He's given you this opportunity now. You've heard what Jesus has done for you. You've heard what He went through on the cross. You've uh, heard that you're a sinner. You've read it in the Word. What are you going to do with it? See, this is the point where if my house was on fire, like I gave the example a while ago, and I said, no, I just want to sleep a couple hours longer, I know what TJ would do. He'd grab me up by the collar, whether I wanted to or not, and take me kicking and screaming 
out the front door. Here's the hardest part as a child of God and especially as a pastor. We can warn you all, we can warn you, and we can beg and plead and cry, but when it comes down to it, I can't grab anybody by the collar and say, you're getting down here and getting right with God. If that's the way it worked, I believe we could get enough of us big guys in here and we'd drag anybody down here. But you know, it's not the way it works. It's an individual thing between you and God. We present the message and now it's up to you and Him. Brother, if you want to get your song, come ahead. We're going to give the invitation this morning. I say we kind of loosely. The invitation is given by God. <coughs>